Hi, I'm Barb Bunnell. I'm the Nutrition Education Advisor from Tippecanoe County. And today we are going to talk about fixing food safely. A perfect topic to have right now between the pandemic and um, getting ready for the holidays. It's real easy to start making food and thinking it's safe and then all of a sudden you've got someone sick from what you actually cooked. So um, as we talk today, I'm also going to show you a recipe that is pretty simple, um, but it's a great way to use some vegetables and fruits that you're going to find available right now that you might not find other parts of the year. And I've got it pretty well put together, but I want to show you a couple of things uh, with us. And we're going to make roasted Brussels sprouts with apple and ham. And Brussels sprouts are oftentimes confused. Um, that they taste funny, they're kind of hard, they, you know, people look at them and say, what are they? Um, they're really just baby cabbages is how I like to look at them, but important that we wash them really, really well, and then before we cut them so that we don't cut any bacteria into the actual vegetable, and we also then want to clean them up before we actually put them in the container. So we're going to just cut that little bit off and then you're going to pull some of these leaves that are a little bit soft off and it's going to look like this. So it really looks like a little baby cabbage. Um, and then for the recipe, we're just going to cut them in half. Um, and this is also a good thing because sometimes, and you can see this one has a little brown on the inside, I oftentimes will just take my finger and see how much of that is. If it's going to go down, if it's too far, then I'll take the knife and cut the center out. Um, nothing wrong with it, it's just that maybe it's um, been on the shelf in the refrigerator a little bit longer, um, but it's still safe to eat that. So I just cut that out. This side didn't have it. So you're ready to put those in the actual recipe. So what the recipe is, is it calls for Brussels sprouts, it calls for an, a cooking apple. And I'll tell you, sometimes we get confused on what is a good cooking apple. If you like the flavor of the apple and it doesn't get real soft, then you can use it. Um, uh, Granny Smith is probably one of the best or a John and Gold, but we don't always have those. So don't say, I can't make this recipe if I don't have an actual cooking apple, because you can. It's just gonna be a little bit softer than what it would be if you hadn't have. Um, the other thing is, it's gonna take a little bit of onion. It calls for red onion. I didn't have red onion, so I used a white onion. Um, and I usually try to use a sweet onion so it's not quite as bitey, because onions right now can be a little bit bitey. Um, and then it takes a little bit of vegetable oil. It takes a boneless ham steak. You can also use deli ham. You can use turkey. You could use bacon. Um, the bacon would have to be uh, fried or cooked or baked in the oven before you used it, but you could use any of those uh, types of meat in this. A little bit of honey mustard. Um, and the honey mustard, if you don't have honey mustard, you just take mustard with a little bit of honey and mix it together, which is what I did, to pour over the top and then pepper. Um, so that's all it takes. It takes, after the preparation, it takes about 15 minutes for it to be prepared. And you can do it on a, a cookie sheet. This recipe can also be cut in half real easy uh, so that you don't have as much left over. Now, when I make it for my grandkids, it needs to be tripled. Uh, so just so you know, it's an easy recipe to make. And then you bake it for 425 for 15 minutes. So I'm going to show you here. I'm going to go ahead and talk. Um, um, but I'm going to show you the end product and then we'll talk a little bit about the other. This is the end product. Um, I put the ham in, the apples are in. If you use a brighter apple, I used a Fuji, um, so it wasn't as bright. The brighter the apple, you, it's going to be a little bit easier. It's going to be a little bit redder. You don't cut the skins off. Um, but this is all it is. Uh, and my grandkids absolutely love this. They'll eat this over any other vegetable that we might have. So it's an easy recipe to make. Um, I used this container because I was bringing it in to, to show how to make it, but you make it on a cookie sheet usually. But for my husband and I, I make it on this and I use our toaster oven so I don't have to warm up the oven. So I also conserve energy by being able to put it in here. So you see the mustard on the top, hopefully, when it came out, I threw the ham in, I put the mustard and the um, honey mustard on top. I, I 
mix it all up and this is the finished product and it's really a great recipe it's a great recipe to go with turkey um, it's a great recipe just to add to uh, just about any menu I can have it and it, I can be guaranteed it's going to go away so the important thing is though is that once you have it if you're not going to eat it right away that you make sure you get it in the refrigerator the other piece that I didn't do before I started, um, that I hopefully all of you caught, was I didn't say to start by washing your hands. Um, I had washed my hands before I got started, but I should tell you to always wash your hands, wash your counter, and wash everything off before you start, which I did. Um, but just so that I reiterate that to you, that we've got to wash our counters and our hands before we get started. So a real, real easy recipe to make. Um, and to keep in and the reason I cut it in half is because I don't like leftovers and I think it tastes better fresh than it does with leftovers but it's still my husband eats it in the middle of the night because he loves it so it's a great recipe and Brussels sprouts if you've never tried them it's a great little recipe to try because you're going to get some good flavors uh, and not be totally turned off by what the Brussels sprouts taste like. So as we fix things safe we're going to talk about cleaning, cooking, separating, and chilling our foods and it's important to keep our families healthy especially during these difficult times that we uh, question do I have a stomach ache do I have a cold do I have COVID we don't really know so making sure that we're keeping ourselves safe from food is one way that we can make sure that we don't have to go to the hospital or to the doctor to find out if we have anything wrong with us so to go together is physical activity and keeping our food safe. And keeping our food safe is really a full-time job if you have two or three kids at home. Um, but it's also important just for one person because it's easy to have food to go bad on you faster when there's only one person eating or two people eating it than if you have a whole family that eats through the whole bag of Brussels sprouts uh, and, or a whole bag of apples in just a couple of settings. For my husband and I, it takes us a little bit longer to get through that same amount of food, so we have to protect how we store it. Um, but one of the things that you want to make sure is that you're also getting physical activity uh, to keep yourself self healthy. And knowing that we should get 30 minutes a day of physical activity is extremely important, especially as we go into the winter months because we can't get out and walk or we can't do some of the side activities we've done this summer. We want to make sure that we've got a plan to be inside. So one of the things that I oftentimes just tell my classes is, you know, you can just do this. That's exercise. You can march in place with your grandkids or play a game with your grandkids that you're moving around, you're wrestling on the floor with them, whatever. That's exercise. You just have to be careful that you uh, don't hurt yourself and that you, uh, if you feel pain, that you stop immediately because you don't want to hurt yourself any further. But we need to stay active. It's real easy as we go into winter um, to not stay active and I know I've talked to a lot of people and they they told me they've gained the COVID-19 and they're not looking forward to going into winter because they've gained those 19 pounds or 20 pounds since the pandemic started and they're not wanting to put another 20 on this winter so being active every day is really one of the most important things that we have to do so as we talk about keeping ourselves safe from food um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I will obviously answer them for you since we're videoing this, but uh, which foods do we think lead to the most illnesses? Would it be frozen foods, fresh produce, or canned foods? Well, if you were thinking it's fresh produce, you're correct. And that is because we oftentimes don't cook our fresh produce. We eat it raw. And eating it raw, it still has a lot of um, chemicals and different debris in that from the farm on it so we don't get that all cleaned off and it can cause us to have some um, issues from it. So we want to make sure we wash all of our fruits and vegetables even if it has a skin on it. Like with the um, Brussels sprouts you're going to peel part of that off but you still want to wash it. Wash it before you use it, before you start cutting it so you don't cut any germs in it as well as washing it afterwards so in case it picked anything up while you were cutting it. Uh, so fruits and vegetables, number one uh, produce that causes illnesses. 
based on the Center for Disease Control, how many people do you think suffer from foodborne illnesses in a year? 1 billion, 48 million, 340,000, or 1.4 million? If you thought 48 million, you were correct. And we've seen a lot of numbers when we're watching all the COVID numbers now, but 48 million people to have a foodborne illness is a lot of people. That means we, it comes down to one in six people become sick from some kind of foodborne um, illness. 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 people a year die from a foodborne illness. That's a lot of people when you think about we could have prevented all of it if we had prepared our food correctly. The other question is, what do you think is common ways for us to contaminate our food? The biggest reason or way that we contaminate our food, what do you think it is? The biggest, biggest way to contaminate food is improper washing and improper hand washing. Okay, so washing your hands, and this is perfect during the COVID because that's what we all do all the time, is to wash your hands. It takes us just seconds to wash our hands if we do it correctly, and it can um, keep all the illnesses away if we continue to wash our hands. But 50% of all foodborne illnesses come from not washing our hands correctly. So washing your hands correctly, you're gonna wash for 20 seconds, ABCs, happy birthday. You're gonna get your hands wet. You're gonna put soap on your hands and then you're gonna go like this and you're gonna go between your fingers. You're gonna go so underneath your fingernails. If you've got a brush to clean under your fingernails, you wanna do that. Um, you want to go up your arms some so that you make sure that any germs that might be there get washed down the drain. And then you're going to wash them under the water and then you're going to dry them good. Um, and I know a lot of people right now with it being it's starting to dry out our skin and that, you're going to want to make sure to um, get them dry but not too dry so you don't take all the moisture out of your skin. Uh, so really washing your hands, not only for COVID, but for foodborne illnesses is critical for us to be able to keep our hands clean so we don't pass on germs. So while we're talking about clean, that's 20 seconds. And uh, just the other day, my granddaughter was in the bathroom and I heard her going, happy birthday. And I'm like, it's Noah's birthday. But she was quick to start singing that she's five years old and she was quick to start singing so that she knew how long she had done her hands. Before COVID, I don't know that she would have done that. So I'm thankful that she now knows to, to count and wash her hands for 20 seconds. We also want to make sure that we wash cutting boards. Um, any dishes, utensils, counters, everything gets washed off before you start. And oftentimes um, in the evening when you're finished with your last meal, you wipe off the kitchen table, you wipe off the counter, we put everything away and then we have utensils, uh, maybe the toaster sets out or the coffee pot sets out. We need to wash those off also because they also have germs that get on them that can cause have some kind of an illness. So it's not only just washing your counters, but it's also washing off anything that might be sitting out on that counter. Um, we also want to make sure that we're using hot soapy water and making sure that we rinse it off good. Um, and if you're do, doing a cutting board, you want to wash it in between foods that you're using it for if you only have one cutting board. A lot of people have two or three cutting boards and they have one for meat and one for vegetables and fruits and one for anything else. So if you have that, that's great, but making sure that you use them that way is the, is the big piece. Uh, also consider using paper towel. I know a lot of people don't like to use paper towel uh, because it is costly, uh, but it also, you throw away those germs. If you're using a dishcloth, you want to change that dishcloth every day. It is uh, full of germs after just a few washings um, and making sure that you rinse it out good after you've used that washcloth, but making sure that each day you throw it in, into your dirty clothes so that it can be washed um, instead of being there for a week. Um, making sure we rinse our fresh fruits and vegetables. And I like to tell if you get a, a watermelon, just put them underneath there. And if you don't have any kind of fruit fresh, cleaner or anything, just take a little bit of Dawn soap and put it on it and wash it all off. 
and then let it dry because that way you're killing any bacteria that might be on it from moving through the store and everything. And it's not going to cut into it unless you don't wash it, the germs aren't gonna cut into it. But a lot of times people will say, well, I took the skin off. Well, if you took the skin off and you didn't wash it, you have a great chance that you probably got some of that bacteria in it. Um, if you don't have a good cleaner, I've written up here, a handmade sanitizing solution is a fourth of a teaspoon of unscented bleach. If you can't find unscented bleach, you can use regular bleach and two cups of water, but not hot. Put that in a spray bottle, put it in an old Dawn soap container or your dish soap container um, and use that to clean with. You have to be careful with the bleach in it that you, um, I try to not use a good dishcloth because it sometimes does stain it or to bleach it out, uh, especially if I got a little too much bleach in it. Um, but I also, when I use that, I wash off my entire counter. Then I take another cloth that's just soap and water and I go over it because I don't want to leave that bleach on the counter. Uh, sometimes we, when we clean with bleach water, we think, oh, it's all clean, it smells good, but that bleach is still there. So if you put something down, I don't want to put food on top of that. So I wash it off again uh, to make sure that I've got it good and clean. So cleaning is really, really critical. First step before we start cooking in our kitchen. Separating food um, starts when we, we are in the grocery store. So you're putting your food in your cart. You try to put your meat in one section as opposed to having all mixed together. So in case you've got some kind of meat that possibly wasn't wrapped correctly, that it doesn't start having some bleed through covered with meat juice um, because it might have gotten through the cardboard of the macaroni box. So we want to separate our raw meat. We want to separate um, eggs when we put them in the grocery, in the, in the, in the refrigerator and in our cart. And we want to make sure that all those foods, as we separate them, when we get home, that we put them in the refrigerator. If you don't have time to store them correctly, if you're going to freeze some things, if you bought, or you've got some things that are large quantities and you need to break them down, make sure you put them in the refrigerator. And if it's a meat item, you put it on a plate and you set it on the bottom shelf of your refrigerator so it doesn't leak down on anything. Um, all, oftentimes I also will still leave it wrapped in the plastic bag so it gets an extra coverage when it goes into the refrigerator if I'm not going to freeze it right away or if I'm not going to cook it right away. Um, use cutting boards, the different ones as I explained before, and never place cooked food on a plate that was used for raw food. So if your husband goes out to cook the chicken on the grill and takes it all out on a plate, he needs to have another plate to bring that food back in because all the germs that are on that plate. Oftentimes we think, well, if I just come in and rinse it off, you really should just put that in the dishwashing area and get a new plate to actually uh, serve it on. Cooking, cooking beets, eggs, fish, shellfish, all have to be cooked to a safe temperature. Uh, you will hear oftentimes that it has to stay there for five minutes, especially beef doesn't have to get to that temperature, past that temperature, it just wants to get to that temperature and stay there for five minutes. So sometimes um, someone may cook a steak to 300 degrees and it cools off fairly rapidly, but it stays at the 160 degrees, 165 degrees for five minutes. So it's safe to eat. That's how it, it kills the um, bacteria and germs that's in that meat. So fish gets cooked to 145 degrees. Beef and pork gets cooked to 145 degrees. Ground beef, or hamburger as we sometimes call it, gets cooked to 160 degrees. Poultry to 165, so your turkey has to get to 165, and we're gonna talk about where we put that thermometer in at. And ground turkey and chicken, chicken also, the ground piece of it has to go to 165. So when you are putting a thermometer in your meat, you put it in an area that is, if you're using a turkey or a chicken, you don't let it touch the bone. Or if you've got a steak, you don't let it touch the bone because you're gonna get a misreading. It needs to go into a thick part of that. Usually I stick it in um, the chicken breast or the turkey breast as opposed to the turkey thigh. Um, and so that's where I stick it in to see if it's done. Now, a lot of times with turkeys, you get the little pop-up kind that tell you when it's done, which is great. 
Um, but if you don't have that, you want to make sure that you do have a thermometer to check if that meat is cooked long enough. Cook, not cooking meat oftentimes makes people sick fairly quickly. Um, and it's one that we can avoid really, really simple. If you don't have a uh, thermometer, um, I would suggest that, that we try to get one. Um, I'm not sure if thermometers are on the Incendi program for food finders, but if it is, that's one of the things I would say you should try to get. Um, also then, as we are cooking, um, we also want to make sure uh, that if you are pregnant, that if you're eating any cold cuts or hot dogs, that you cook those or warm them up before you eat them to kill the bacteria. Also, children under the age of five should have those foods cooked to 165 degrees before they actually get to eat them. So it's just a safety for that mama um, to make sure that she's not eating any food that might not have been processed or um, has a little fermentation or something on it from how it was prepared. Chilling is the last piece, and this one is uh, one that uh, comes near and dear to all of our hearts because it includes our refrigerator. And um, refrigerators are probably the one area of the kitchen that most of us don't like to clean. Uh, and it's one that should be done once a week. And also how your refrigerator is laid out. If you have your milk on the door, you should move it. It should be on the middle shelf towards the back because the coldest part of the refrigerator is the back of the refrigerator. And the milk is one of those things that can spoil fairly quickly if it's sitting on the door and it won't stay at a good temperature if it's on the door. Keeping things on the door, such as condiments or things that won't spoil your salad dressings or um, vinegar oils and things like that that you have, ketchups can stay on the door. Um, eggs should go in to the actual refrigerator. Uh, so really the door, as we have so many times thought, it's like it, back in when I was a child, it was so fun to get the new refrigerator and they had the little places, compartments for the eggs while they were on the door and they shouldn't have been on the door because they didn't keep them to the right temperature. Unless the eggs, were fresh eggs and the membrane hadn't been broken on them. So, but if it's a store-bought egg, it should be in the refrigerator on the shelf. Um, your refrigerator temperature should be between 100 and uh, 40 degrees. It goes between 40 and 140 is the danger. So your refrigerator should be kept between 34 and 40 degrees and your freezer should be set at zero. So if you have a refrigerator, and I know of several of my clients who have refrigerators that are hot sometime and cold sometime, it is um, advantageous to have a refrigerator a thermometer to see where what the temperature is. And you can set that in different parts of your refrigerator to see if it is really staying as cold as it should. And it's just really important that you're at 34 to 40 degrees for the actual refrigerator and zero degrees for your freezer so that everything stays the right temperature. When I say danger, uh, bacteria grows very fast when it's not at the right temperature. So that's when we say that it's at a danger. And bacteria, you can have five bacteria um, on, let's say the Brussels sprouts that I made and we let that Brussels sprouts set out for two hours. In two hours, that five bacteria turns to 20,000 bacteria on that that little Brussels sprouts is sitting there. So as we get ready for Thanksgiving, it's really, really important that we store our food correctly if it's gonna set out for any time. And I know a lot of times at Thanksgiving, we have lunch and then we go back and we have leftovers for dinner. Well, those leftovers need to go to the freezer or the refrigerator so that you can have them later on and have them safe to eat. Um, if you're going to heat it up, someone will ask me, well, if I'm going to heat it up, can I just leave it on the counter? No, it needs to go back to the refrigerator and be stored correctly. If you have a bunch of food, salads and things like that, if you put um, a bowl with ice in it with another bowl in it, you want to make sure that you continue to change your ice, but you can do that as long as that temperature stays at a safe temperature for that food. Um, you also want to make sure that if you're dividing large leftovers or large items that you've bought, that you um, do that quickly and put them in your freezer or your refrigerator so that they're not sitting on the counter. 
if for some reason your refrigerator or freezer dies on you or we have an electrical storm or, and it, it, the power goes out, um, if anything has thawed out in the freezer, it cannot be refrozen unless you cook it. So if you had hamburger in your freezer and it thawed out during a storm, you can cook it and you can put it back in your freezer, but it has to be cooked and that's because it, kick, it kills the bacteria that was growing on it from the freezer breaking down and it coming, becoming unthawed. So it's a safe way to save food is to have to cook it, but it's a, you know, if your whole freezer unthaws, and you have to cook all that food. It takes a lot of time to get all that food cooked and back in the freezer. So you're gonna lose some of it because you probably can't cook everything that was there to put it back in the freezer in time. So we wanna make sure also then if we have questions about keeping things clean, cooking at the right temperature, separating it correctly, or chilling it correctly, that if you have questions about that, there is a app um, that you can put on your iPhone or your, um, iPad and it's called Food Keeper and it is approved by the USDA and you can go in and we'll just say that we're going to uh, food pur purchase frozen and I'm going to look at a frozen entree that I picked up and it tells me it's not where it says for freshness and quality this item should be consumed within uh, immediately once it's thawed out. Um, it's not refrigerated after cooking due to decreased quality. So you really, it's not something that you're gonna to wanna to keep leftovers of. And it can stay frozen for up to 12 months in your freezer. After that, you have to question if it's really safe, especially if the temperatures in your freezer had changed or anything. So this app, and I know you can't see it on here, but it has everything that you need. It tells you if you're gonna cook a steak, it tells you what temperature to cook it at um, and how, you to, how to store it. There's also, um, and I will leave, have these on the site, um, USDA, how does cross-contamination happen? So it will explain to you how foods become contaminated and also um, a site where you can search for food safety. So it'll tell you uh, different things about how to keep food safe. So if you're not sure, uh, you know, eggs, one of my clients one time said, I've had eggs for two months, are they safe? And I, laughed of course and said no um, but they were hard boiled from easter and she thought because they were hard boiled they were still safe to have they're not safe after that time i think they're safe after six days uh, up to six days so all of that is on this food keeper app it's also if you go to the site um, on on your computer or on an ipad or iphone you can pick up several different safety um, lines to get information on how to keep food safe and really, that's one of those places that I go to often just to make sure that just what is on the container makes me comfortable with what I'm doing with it so that I don't um, waste food that I could keep in my refrigerator for longer or less time. So it's really important to store it correctly and to make sure that it's safe at all times. You don't, if you're not sure if something is safe to eat, my advice is to not eat it. Uh, oftentimes I will have someone say, well, I just tasted it and it didn't taste funny. It may not taste funny, but there could be enough bacteria on it to cause you to be one of those uh, 128,000 people that has to go to the hospital because of the foodborne illness. So this time of year, um, going into Thanksgiving and Christmas and the holidays and you're taking, uh, not so much this year that we're going to people's houses and taking food and that, but at the same time at home, you wanna make sure that your food stays safe so that um, you can uh, keep it longer and not have to spend money that you really don't have. Uh, the same thing when you go to food finders, if you're picking up supplies there, you want to make sure that you get it home as quickly as you can and put it in the refrigerator so that it's not setting in your car. And, you know, on a hot day, you definitely don't want to leave things in the car for any length of time because they're going to start growing uh, bacteria that you don't want on them. So I just want you to stay safe. I want you to try some fun recipes. Uh, just remember that when you're chopping, that you're using different cutting boards so that you don't cross contaminate from the cutting boards that you're using. And just try lots of recipes and have fun, but remember to be safe, wash your hands, wash your countertops, 
Um, and if you're not sure if it's clean, clean it again. Um, and if you don't have a cleaner, try this little handy cleaner because it definitely helps to keep the house um, safer during these challenging times. Thanks.